Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Engling, and I'm a member of the Teaching with Technology Collaborative. Um, I come from Health Information Technology and Services over at Michigan Medicine. And I wanted to welcome you to today's event. Um, this is the 2018 Enriching Scholarship Conference, and this is our 21st one. Um, so before we get started, so I just want to say that this group, the Teaching Technology Collaborative in this event, is uh, it's very special to me. Uh, and with this group, I don't know how many of you know much about us, but the thing is, uh, each month uh, we get together um, and it's folks from all across the university, different units, different schools, and we come together each month to, you know, first off, talk with one another, learn what's happening in our different areas, share our experiences, uh, learn from one another. Sometimes somebody has something that they're working on and wants to throw an idea out for a group, think of something that they can take back to their unit. Um, so we really get the chance to connect and to really you know, spanned the, you know, sometimes miles in between our different schools and campuses here. And um, for me, for somebody who's been, you know, part of the TTC for a few years, I've really appreciated that and I've been coming to events like this for even longer than that. But, you know, it's an opportunity for me, for somebody like over in Michigan Medicine, where things are a little bit different in the way that we do things. You know, we don't follow the same academic calendar. Um, the way we do courses and stuff are very different. Often a lot of our teaching uh, includes like the professional residents and doctors that are out there. So my experience when I come to these meetings is from a little bit different of an area. Um, but it's very valuable to me to be able to come together and hear about all the different perspectives and things that are going on and take what I can back to my unit, which is often quite a bit, and hopefully connect my coworkers to the work that's being happening on Central Campus. So standing out here in front of today, you know, look in a room, you know, that's, you know, somewhere around 200 people plus, I can, you know, everybody, some, everyone coming next to you is probably from a different part of campus. Um, when you go to your sessions, who knows where they're from. So I'm gonna encourage you to reach out, connect with the folks, because um, we don't get together like this very often, at least once a year that we have it planned. But, um, so I encourage you to, to learn and to share with the folks that you're with. So um, that's my message for you today. Um, so the Teaching Technology Collaborative, uh, this is a big event for us, and I'd like to, of course, acknowledge all the different groups that help make this possible. Um, so first and foremost, I would like to thank all the different units that supply uh, either resources or give us the opportunity for the members to, to come and take part in this wonderful event um, and help throughout the year. Um, we really appreciate their support and being able to do that. Um, next, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the Enriching Scholarship Planning Committee. So if any of those folks are here in this room, which I'm sure there's a few, if you wouldn't mind, just stand up for just a quick moment so you can be recognized. Um, These are the folks that make Enriching Scholarship happen um, each and every year. So a lot of love, a lot of labor, um, and making sure things are working the way they need to be and we can continue to bring a good uh, quality conference. Um, also, I uh, just want to take a moment to recognize uh, somebody who's helped us out quite a bit here, Lisa Toon. She's somewhere in this room, um, I think. Um, she's from CRLT, and uh, she worked closely with our keynote committee in helping making sure that this room, this space, and everything was in place the way that we needed to be. So we appreciate Lisa's efforts on that. Um, also, I'd like to take time to thank all the presenters. If, are there any presenters in the room here today? If you might take the stand up or raise hands. That's good. All right, raise hands. Good. Wow. <laughs> We want to thank all of you because uh, we appreciate you sharing your knowledge uh, with all the folks within the community here. And without you, you know, we definitely would not be here doing this in the way that we're doing it. Um, and finally, you know, just thank everybody for attending because, you know, once again, without folks attending Enriching Scholarship, without the desire to learn and share, uh, you know, there wouldn't be much reason to be here. So we appreciate everybody taking part. Um, so online. We, uh, we we're actually streaming today, so I want to, you know, we have a number of folks out there, uh, possibly from all of the other campuses, Dearborn and Flint, so I want to thank you all for attending um, and taking part in today's celebration. 
Um, all right, so a little bit uh, about Enriching Scholarship this year. So first off, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are giving you Friday off. Um, we did go to a four-day schedule this year, so we're giving you an extra day to get started on all the different things um, that you learn throughout the program. Uh, we just worked on that based on feedback that we heard from the program and wanted to really focus up on delivering a good core set of uh, sessions for you this year. So um, hopefully that you know, that will work out good for everybody. Um, this year we're offering excuse me, um, over 75 different sessions. So we really have a really great offerings uh, from across the university in the form of individual sessions. We have uh, included more lightning talks this year, which we started last year. Um, and those are um, panels of, well not panels, but this is a series of speakers uh, coming together, giving short like 10, um, 15 minute talks on what they're doing out in their units, how are they teaching, something that they've, some innovation they did, or just how they're doing things and get a good chance to see uh, a whole lot of different presenters all at once. Um, we also included this year more what we, what we called the pay it forward sessions, and this is new. Um, and the pay it forward sessions, they are uh, six opportunities that we have to explore and perhaps even get the chance to contribute to a variety of online projects and services that are out there for public good. Uh, the basic idea behind these are you will go, you'll participate, you'll give back to the community, but then you'll also learn how you can take that activity back to your classroom. So maybe these are experiences that you want to do with your your students um, in order to have an active learning activity. Um, also, just wanted to make a, a, a note, because this was kind of an interesting one for us, um, that the first workshop to fill up this year uh, at this you know, technology and learning conference was actually a workshop that um, was on how to engage your students with no technology. That was the first one to fill up. So we thought that was definitely an interesting one and definitely something we're going to be looking at uh, for the years coming forward. Um, also, at, at the, you will be receiving a conference survey, so we really want to hear from you and get your feedback on how you thought this year's conference went. So when you get that email, please fill it out. It'll only take just a few moments to do, and we really look at that information and can use it to move forward. Uh, if you are attending a session and you're perhaps on a wait list, um, as always, we encourage you to still go to that session even if you're on the wait list. Uh, often those uh, sessions, you know, people drop at the last minute and there will be room in those uh, sessions. So please, we encourage you to go. Uh, today, if you are watching on our streamed live feed, uh, you can participate in the discussion. So if you have any questions for our keynote speaker, um, you can just uh, go to, we have a, a Google Hangout set up for you, and the address for that is tinyurl.com slash es18hangout, and that's all one word, es18hangout. Uh, so that's tinyurl.com uh, slash es18hangout. Okay, so now what I want to do is move on to our annual Provost Teaching Innovation Prize Awards. And at this time, I'd like to welcome James Hilton, our Vice Provost for Academic Innovation, uh, the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor, University Library Dean of Libraries, uh, and Professor of Information. James, welcome up. Good morning. So this is really always one of my favorite events. Um, I've been at Michigan now uh, a total of 25 years. And when people ask me what are the things that you know, changed the most over that 25 years, uh, the thing that to me has changed the most actually is this university's intentional engagement with teaching and learning. Um, uh, it's a very different place now uh, than it was uh, it, 30 years ago, but I left for a little while. Um, it's a very different place. And uh, a large part of that, I think, is actually this annual conference, a time to come together and intentionally think about uh, how we uh, think about the relationship between the research mission, the teaching mission, how we engage students, how we think about a changing uh, demographic, how we think about technology and non-technology, uh, how we become more uh, uh, data and theory informed uh, I think that uh, that's uh, happened here uh, with a vengeance, and it's really welcome. I, I also, this particular part, the, the Provost Teaching Innovation Prizes, is always one of my favorite parts. And uh, I confess that one of the great regrets that I have is when I was in my youth, I thought that ceremonies were, like, stupid. And so I uh, skipped my uh, hooding uh, when I got my PhD. I uh, went to my uh, 
uh, undergraduate uh, ceremony because my parents made me, right? And, uh, and, and I now deeply regret that because I think that one of the things that I've learned as I've gotten older is we too infrequently stop to celebrate uh, on the journey. And so I think it's a great thing that every year we not only gather here to reflect on the teaching mission and how it articulates with the rest of what we do at the university, but that we also take a minute to celebrate a fraction of the successes um, that happen here every day. So um, it's a, uh, on behalf of the sponsors, uh, which are the Office of the Provost, the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, and the Library, welcome to the presentation of the 2018 Provost Teaching Innovation Prizes. And we have five winners um, this year, and I'm going to ask each one, and if, and if it's a team, if there's a team for the team to come up, we have a, have a lead for each person, for each one, um, to come up uh, and stand up here and I'll try to embarrass you a little bit and then hand you a certificate and uh, we'll do some celebration. Ready? Rock and roll? Okay. So, Barry Belmont. All right. <laughs> you or a team? Just you. C'est moi. Okay. So, uh, Barry Belmont is a lecturer in biomedical engineering and his project is entitled Telling Human Stories, Creating Human Engineers. There's so many things I could think about there. Um, Barry's goal is to put storytelling at the center of his introductory engineering course versus focusing only on math and technical concepts. And to do that, he uses memorable and moving human moments to inspire thoughtful technical reflection. Well-established research shows contextualizing engineering for first-year students helps with retention. In his words, his belief is that to create the kinds of well-rounded, cosmopolitan, creative, confident, and compassionate engineers the future needs, we're going to have to tell them the kinds of stories that make them stay. Uh, so the stories he uses are not short biographical blurbs of scientists. Uh, instead, they center the perspectives of a broader, they center on the perspectives of a broader range of human subjects affected for better or worse by biomedical engineers. Students learn theoretical principles and consider what it means to try to affect change in the world as principled engineers. Please join me in congratulating Barry. Well choreographed, that's what this is. You did a lot of practicing. Next up is Shanaz Brosek. Did I come close to that? All right. Shanaz is a lecturer in business, and her project is entitled Peer Coaching of First Year Students at Scale. Um, Shanaz teaches the first course that the Bachelor of Business Administration students take in Ross. Um, from research, again, we know that teaching accompanied by peer coaching significantly enhances retention of learning. So to that end, last year, 115 paid peer coaches trained to support 569 students in groups of six to seven. Uh, peer coaches receive August orientation plus ongoing biweekly training, and their primary tasks are to facilitate class-based discussions and activities to meet, and to meet at least three times outside of class individually with each student in their groups. This structure benefits both the first year students and the peer coaches. For the first year students, it makes, large, it, makes large com it makes a large community feel small and intimate. It fosters intra and inter cohort relationships development and inclusion and helps temper the rumor to be somewhat competitive culture in Ross. And it normalizes help-seeking and growth mindsets. Um, for peer coaches, it provides an opportunity to engage in action-based learning, and it develops coaching, mentoring, and facilitation skills, and emotional intelligence. Please join me in congratulating Chanel. <laughs> so uh, our third winner is Jesse Hoffman Garsk.
Jesse is an associate professor of American culture and history, and his project is entitled Problem Sets and Flipping Humanities Courses. So this project is an example of how to design an upper-level history course in a flipped format so that time traditionally devoted to lecture is used for project-based learning in small groups. Students were given projects, for example, uh, using LexisNexis to find downstream legal cases that referenced earlier landmark cases as a way of tracing historical changes in immigration policies. Hmm, that's timely. And the class was organized around these projects. Students enjoyed the design of the course. Um, uh, and they involved, read re the readings were highly relevant to the activities. They spent far less time being lectured at. They spent more time getting to interact with each other. And they learned lessons and skills they can apply in their lives. A feature that we deeply believe the humanities provide, but which students and the public sometimes struggle to see. So please join me in congratulating Jesse. Our next winner is Colleen Seifert. Uh, Colleen's project is entitled Creative Challenges, Contributing Real-World Solutions from Classroom Learning. This is an upper-level psychology course uh, on creativity. And the approach that Colleen takes is to leverage relevant online design challenges centered on human behavior. Last year, that meant focusing on an open IDO challenge on how we might inspire experiences and expressions of gratitude in the workplace. Uh, many organizations slash platforms sponsor similar crowdsourcing activities that could be used across many disciplines. Similar to Jesse's course, by trying to solve real social problems through, iterative creative process, through an iterative creative process that entails ideation, revision, and prototyping, from getting feedback from real people, students at other institutions, professional designers, and working through a broad range of perspectives, students in Colleen's class discovered new perspectives on the utility of their education and the value of collaboration. So please join me in congratulating Colleen. And our final winner is Megan Tomp Tompkins Stang. Come on up. I started with the German pronunciation Stange. that worked back. Stange, that's what I had. <clears throat> Usually it's strange, so I'm. I'm uh, Megan is an assistant professor of public policy, and her project is entitled Bringing Philanthropy to Life Through Critical Pedagogy. This is an upper-level undergraduate seminar in which students collectively make grants to real organization with real dollars from the Once Upon a Time Foundation. In this course, students apply concepts discussed in class through a practical lens, experience a learning community in which they practice constructive debate and challenge deeply held norms and assumptions with civility and interrogate and refine their core personal values. God knows we could use more of all that. <laughs> the class culminates with them designing their own private foundations for their final paper. The class is designed to put all students, regardless of their own socioeconomic backgrounds, in a position of relative privilege and power that they then must scrutinize. It forces them to practice allocating scarce resources and making value judgments among alternatives. It's an exciting approach that is moving into pilot phase in collaboration with Poverty Solutions that will allow them to develop a new syllabus cross-listed with U of M Dearborn and gradually expand the course to other campuses like Wayne State and Wayne County Community College. Please join me in congratulating Megan. And now, one final round for that side of the room. And I confess I don't know where I go next. I'm done. You're up next. Thank you. All right. I think wonder if we should get the laptop going back here. Um, so all right. Now, I would like to introduce uh, this year's keynote speaker. 
Uh, Dr. Katie Linder, uh, she is currently the director for the eCampus Research Unit at Oregon State University. Um, she serves as the associate editor for the International Journal of Academic Development. Uh, for the past several years, Katie's work has focused on blended course design best practices, institutional supports for accessibility online learning, and research literacy and scholarship of teaching and learning practitioners and distance education stakeholders. She speaks on topics related to writing and publication, creativity and productivity, self-promotion and personal branding, and teaching and learning with technology. She is an author. Her latest book is The Blended Course Design Workbook, A Practical Guide, and it provides a step-by-step -step course design process that emphasizes active learning and student engagement. Dr. Linder is also a podcaster of not one, but three weekly shows. You, uh, you've got this, The Anatomy of a Book, and Research in Action. And seasonally, she also hosts the Academy Gig podcast. Um, and I don't, also, I don't want to forget that uh, she also writes a weekly essay series as well. So a lot of good resources that you can go to. Uh, in addition to delivering today's keynote address, she'll be leading a workshop this afternoon on creating effective online activities, and that's going to be taking place in this room here. So for those that are taking part of it, this is where you're going to want to be. So and now to kick off our Enriching Scholarship 2018 talk with helping students learn in the age of digital distraction, I'd like to welcome Dr. Katie Linder to our stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I have to start by saying I'm not sure if I was happier to see all of you this morning or the sunshine that was coming in the windows. I heard you had snow on the ground three weeks ago, so I'm sure you're really happy to see that sunshine too. I hope you get a chance to enjoy it today. Um, I have my Twitter handle up here. If anyone happens to be live tweeting the talk this morning, feel free to use that. And I'm very excited to talk with you today about helping our students learn in an age of digital distraction. I want to thank um, the TTC group for bringing me. It's been a really fun time to walk around and see the amazing work that you all are doing. And I'm super impressed. OK, to kick us off today, I want to start with a couple of minutes to just center ourselves into the room. If you saw the questions I sent in advance, you would know that I was interested in the last time that you had had two minutes of silence. So there's this wonderful website called Do Nothing for Two Minutes that I always like to model for people. And you'll see that if you move your mouse, it tells you how you failed to do nothing for two minutes. So what I'd like to do is just actually sit for a couple of minutes if you need to put your phones away, if you need to kind of come into this space, before we get started here. And if our sound is working here, you can get wave noises in the background. So if we can't get it, just imagine the wave noises. So take just a couple of minutes and come into this space. So I'm curious if there was a point during those two minutes where they started to feel kind of long, where you started to think, how much time exactly is left? or this feels longer than two minutes. And I was really curious when I saw the data come back to me that you'd been asked in advance, when was the last time you'd done nothing for two minutes? And several people said, today, yesterday, do it all the time. And I thought, really? Because I never do this. I've always got my phone out, I've got my earbuds in, even when I'm walking to and from places, I have my phone out, I'm like walking into the middle of the street without looking. I, it's very rare, even when I'm on a plane. I was on a, a really long plane ride yesterday, and I didn't really just sit and do nothing for even two minutes. It's something that's becoming really rare for us to just have that time. There's a really excellent book out recently called Bored and Brilliant, which talks about how we need to start doing nothing more so that we can let our brains kind of be in that creative space. I start with this activity because I think it's a nice example of what we can do for our students when they come into our classrooms, whether those are digital classrooms, face-to-face -face classrooms, they come in and they are awash with all kinds of things. Something's happening with their family, they just got a bad score on an exam, they're trying to figure out what to have for dinner, something's happened with one of their children, they're coming in with all of these things and we expect them to just switch right over 
and learn all the things that we have for them in our classrooms. And this is one way that we can model for them. Let's just come into this space and focus on our learning. In today's session, we're going to start by exploring some of our own digital lives and also the realities of today's digital age. What is it that we're all really dealing with when it comes to technology in all aspects of our lives? We're also going to learn more about how the brain is affected by the digital. What do we know so far about brain science and how technology in some ways is kind of working against us in terms of um, helping our brains to function in the most optimal ways. We're going to look at how technologies can help us because oftentimes this becomes kind of an either or battle where we say we'll just ban the laptops and that's going to solve everything. I'm not sure that's true. So we're going to look at how technologies might be able to help us. And we're also going to ask what all of this means for our own classrooms in a very individualized way. When you think about how you're engaging with students, how you're helping students learn, what is it that you need to be doing to help them be better with that. So we are truly living in a different world. Things are changing all the time. I'm wondering if anybody recognizes this photo. Do you know what it is? Some people are saying yes. What do you think it is? I see you nodding back there. Yep, you. Yes, this was at the Vatican. Excellent. So this was the Vatican. Uh, and you see a significant difference from 2005 to 2013. Uh, lots of screens in the audience here. And what I think is really interesting, and, and one of the reasons I like to show this photo, is oftentimes when we think about our students and we think about, well, that generation, they're so different. They have no attention span. They have all these screens. They're so focused on all these other things. They only use technology for entertainment. You know, like we're kind of competing against all these things. The people in that crowd, I can promise you, are not all college students. The ones who are holding up their screens are not within the age demographic that we're typically working with, with our traditionally aged students. And so I want to start our conversation by thinking about how we are actually more in this digital age with our students than we are outside of it. It's something that we have to kind of embrace that we're all dealing with. So to kick us off into that discussion, I'd like to ask you, what are some of your daily digital rituals? And I want you to think about, just to kind of narrow it down, let's just say before you came here this morning, Let's just say in the morning. What are some of the ways that you're engaging with technology on a semi-regular basis? Something that you're kind of doing in a consistent way. So I'd like you to turn to somebody next to you and talk about those kind of morning, daily digital rituals that you have. All right, let's come back. Come on back. Y'all are doing a lot in the morning before you come in here. <laughs> okay, so how many of you, just by show of hands, have some kind of social media engagement in the morning? Okay. Social media would be like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, those kinds of platforms. Well, I'll get there. I'll get to email. Don't you worry. How many people are engaging in email? How many people are engaging in email while you are still in bed? Okay. How many people sleep with your phones next to you when you are sleeping? Okay. How many people listen to podcasts in the morning? Okay. How many people check the weather on some kind of digital device in the morning? Okay. How many people put on something to their bodies to track any kind of fitness? OK. Uh, how many people wear something like an Apple Watch or something along those lines? OK. What else am I missing about your digital rituals? What else did you bring up? Texting. Oh my goodness. How many people are texting in the morning? How many people use GPS to navigate to somewhere? OK. Are you going somewhere different than work every day? <laughs> that you need a GPS? 
I mean, I admit, when I lived in Boston, I used my GPS everywhere I went. But, uh, okay, GPS. What else? What else Fighting with kids about screen time. Fighting with kids about screen time. How many people are engaging in that in the morning? Okay, a good number. I heard something else. Listening to the news. Anybody doing news listening via radio, phone, anything along those lines? Anybody just checking the news on your phone? Yeah. Okay. Public transportation tracking. Anybody doing that in the morning? When's my bus coming? When's my train coming? Okay. School bus. Kids, you have apps for that? I don't have children, so there's a whole other world out there that I am not engaging in. Okay, so you can see a couple of mine up here. I'm an Instagram person, I'm a Twitter person, and I am one of those checking my email in bed people as well. Um, I even have an order in which I check things. I look at the news, then I check Twitter, then I check my podcast downloads, you know, I kind of look around, um, and I do this every morning. I have kind of this routine, the system that I go through, it's really built into my day. The other thing that's become kind of built into my day is having my phone with me all the time. Uh, does anybody here use their phones to check the time? Like, you don't wear a watch anymore, you just use your phone. <laughs> Have you ever experienced that thing where you pull out your phone and you look at it to check the time, and then you realize, like, five minutes later that you don't know what time it is because you weren't really looking at the time, you were looking at something else? Um, have you ever left your phone at home? Heaven help us all when that happens, because then it's like an appendage is gone. Uh, and it feels, there's this anxiety level. How many of you have lived a life pre-cell phone? <laughs> okay, me too. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> but we're in this mode where we have these devices, and really, they are mini computers. They have browsers, we can write on them, we can communicate with other people through them. We are really walking around, carrying around mini computers. And they have become really tied to us. When we don't have them, when I can't find it, there is this moment of like panic. Where is my phone? It has our fingerprint in there. You get into your phone using your fingerprint, in some cases, not all. I mean, this is like a central part of our lives to have these kinds of devices. And it's been built into our lives in a way that feels, in some ways, very natural because it has become routine. We might not like all of it. We might feel distracted by it. We might feel like we don't want to be on Facebook as much as we are, or we know that we should be doing less of it, that, or the other thing. But it's kind of here to stay. Now, did anybody have a very short conversation because they said, I don't really have any digital rituals in the morning? Yeah, be honest. No. Sometimes there's a couple to which I say, go find that person at lunch to figure out what they're doing. And I actually had several people respond to the questions saying things like, I meditate in the morning. That's how I get my two minutes of nothing in, because I am I'm meditating, I'm clearing my mind. Um, and so we know that people are kind of engaging in these practices to try to get away from, from using these technologies. But I, I do this activity to say, whenever we go into a classroom and we do think, this generation, it's not just them. It's all of us. And here's the most difficult question, and I will not have you raise your hands for this one. Have you ever been in a meeting and pulled out your phone to check email, to check a notification, to text someone, to figure out what your plans were for dinner? That generation, they can't stay off their phones. Not even for 45 minutes. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about what does that mean, that we have this too, because it actually really works in our favor. It really helps us to help our students learn because we get it. But we have to stop saying they're over there and we're over here. We have to just kind of lump everyone together and say we're all in this age of digital distraction. Now what does that mean? One of my favorite ways to think about this is this video that was going around a couple of years ago called I Forgot My Phone. Has anybody seen this video? 
Oh, well, we're going to show it. Um, it's a good one. I saw him pull out of the parking lot and turn right, and the box was still stuck under his car. So who knows how long he was driving with that box under his car. I like bet he got home, he pulled into his driveway. Out in the sky. I'm not. I'm not wow. You're like, this. It's not. It's not real. I don't think it's real. Oh, I don't think it's maybe real. Maybe it doesn't I see the line of her car? Wasted. The Empire State Building is like really close to it. So it's okay. <laughs> All right, I heard some laughter. What are some of the emotions that are coming up for you when you watch that? Humor? Sadness? Anger? Loneliness? Annoyance? Nostalgia? Connection? Or lack of thereof? Did anyone feel kind of conflicted? Like, we're doing this, but nostalgia, you know, like you kind of think back, it could be different, experiencing life through a screen, we kind of hear all the time how this is not great for us. What do you think your students would think, kind of your traditionally aged, I don't know, are they still millennials, the next generation? What do you think they would think of a video like this? Yeah, like what's the story? Not a big deal. What was the comment over here? They feel bad for the person who doesn't have the phone. Okay. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Do you think they feel the same conflicted? Do you think they feel sadness? Do you think they would have that same feeling? It depends on who they are. Right. 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 They're not all the same person. Excellent. So there is this YouTube channel called Teens React, and they react to internet memes, and they reacted to this video. So, I'd like to show you what some of the teens had to say. Let's see what this, this kind of younger generation has to say about this particular one. I saw him pull out of the parking lot and turn right, and the box was still stuck under his car. I'm not, I'm not. Wow. Is this just like the daily lives of people? You know what was my biggest pet peeve? When I'm with someone and they text, like, in the middle of a conversation. That's me every day with my friends. They hate it. Gosh. <laughs> Is he taking a selfie while proposing? Wait, did he just propose with a selfie? Oh no, he's videoing it! I don't understand why kids have phones! 
When I was six, I played with Legos. That pisses me off when I see like a four year old with an iPhone. Oh, selfies. Selfie. <laughs> like, even though it's happening right in front of him, he's watching it through a screen. That is like my life. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. It's actually really sad. <laughs> Duck face <and> deuces. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's taking selfies. That's so me. <laughs> Live in the moment. Don't record it. That's so true, like, there's a girl right next to you and you're still on your phone, like, priorities, man. What a shitty boyfriend. That was deep. That's like 100% true. That's my current generation. <laughs> That's my current generation. Hold on, I gotta take a selfie. Twitter teens react swag! What's kind of interesting, though, is as you can see, they're kind of as conflicted. I mean, it's a relatively small sample size. We're not talking about this large survey of, of teenagers. But they look at that and they see what's happening. They get it. And they understand that it's not necessarily ideal to be looking at a world through a screen, to be navigating the world in that way, to lose that kind of connection. They may not have the same nostalgia feeling because they may not have grown up with it, but they know that something is missing. And I think if we start from that place of we are in this together, we're not fighting against each other about it. We're trying to figure out how we can navigate this new landscape of all of this data and information and technology, we're trying to figure it out together. We can help our students to not just do that now, but to do it when they leave us. Because when they leave us, think about the kinds of professional development opportunities they'll have. They'll probably be online. They'll probably be at lynda.com or some kind of online training that they have to do. It will involve technology. There will be no laptop ban in our company, where they go. And so the more we can incorporate this and kind of figure it out, the more we can help them. So let's look at what we're all kind of dealing with here. Clive Thompson has this great book, Smarter Than You Think. It's on the list that was on your seat, um, the citations. And these numbers are actually a little bit out of date. So you can think of them as actually being higher. Every day we write 154 billion emails. We write more than 500 million tweets. There are over 1 million blog posts on WordPress alone. And you know that is not the only blogging platform out there. And we send 12 billion text messages every day. That is the equivalent of 36 million books a day. Library of Congress. Currently, I have 16 million books. The amount of text, we're not even talking anything beyond that. I'll get there in just a second. But just the text that is coming into our lives in a range of ways is very overwhelming. And this has caused us to have some literacy changes. Whereas before, in a more traditional classroom, pre-technology, we were focused more on things like reading, note-taking, consumption of prose, static artifacts that were unchanging, learning from a teacher, and relatively permanent facts. If you learn this thing, this is all you will need to know. It will not be changing. Now we have shifted into a more digital landscape where instead of reading, we're just skimming. And the internet is built for that, and I'll talk about that as well in just a second. We're curating, we're just gathering things because we know we can get to things later. We have multimodal consumption, lots of video, lots of multimedia. The assets are now dynamic. They're changing, they're being updated all the time. We're now expected to teach ourselves in that space. And it's kind of constant change. So there are fundamental aspects of education that have had to change along with this as well. One of the key ones that I've heard, and that faculty I've worked with in the past have really struggled with, is Google now exists. And that means that you don't have to memorize things like you used to have to memorize them because you couldn't get them at your fingertips. It was a necessity to store that information. 
And so a lot of our education was built around how do we transfer things into long-term storage because we know that students will need it for efficiency's sake when they become lawyers, when they become doctors. Well, now we have all these things at our fingertips that that memorization in some cases, not all, but in some cases, it's really not needed. We don't need to teach those facts anymore. And we've shifted more to teaching things like skills and things like information literacy. How do you know that when you find things on the internet, they're true or they're a good quality or you can actually use them for the purposes that you need to? That has created a fundamental shift, not just in our curriculum, but in terms of how we train people to teach and also how we work with our students in terms of how they learn. In the midst of all of this, though, we have this information overload. 10% of all books ever published were published in the last year. 300 million photos are uploaded to Facebook every day. 10% of all photos ever created were taken in the last year. And 90% of all data ever created was created in the past two years. Mind blown. That's crazy to think about. And we have all this data floating around. We don't quite know what to do with it. We're still trying to build the tools to figure out how the data can help us. We're also, I think, many of us skeptical about how that data is going to be used, including our students, how we're collecting and using this data. But most of all, we're in a situation like this, <laughs> where we are trying to desperately take in the information, figure out what's important, how to process it, how to apply it to our lives, to our learning, to our classrooms. And we have this constant state of feeling like we're behind. And the internet runs on that. It's called FOMO, fear of missing out. And it is the foundation of the internet. It is, its entire goal is to have you check it the first thing you wake up in the morning and the last thing before you go to bed at night so that you haven't missed anything important. And for us as teachers, it creates this challenge. This is one of my favorite quotes. A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. It's from 1971, which I think is really important to note. But when we have all of this stuff coming at us, visually, text-based, we don't know where to look. We don't know how to prioritize it. We don't know how to use it. And that is the landscape in which our students come into our classrooms, where we're giving them more. But it's, the, it's just the important stuff. This is the really important stuff that they need to know. How do they do that? How do they take that information in in a way that they know it's valuable, that they know what to do with it, that they know how to move forward with it? I want to talk just a little bit more about this FOMO generation, which could include all of us. We know that mobile phone users check their devices up to 150 times a day. Now, if you think about that for a second, you realize it's actually true. Like, how many times do you pick out your phone, look at the time, and not really look at the time, check your notifications? Like, it's just become second nature for us. Uh, one study found that 67% of cell owners find themselves checking their phones for messages, alerts, or calls, even when they don't notice their phone ringing or vibrating. And almost half have slept with their phone next to their bed because they wanted to make sure they didn't miss any calls. There were more than half in this room that are sleeping with their phones next to their beds. In this generation, traditional TV viewing is six days worth of time per month. 28 hours of internet on a computer, and in smaller amounts on online video, video on mobile, game consoles, DVD, Blu-rays. But this is what, if we are going to say there's a competition, this is what we're competing against, is all of this entertainment coming in the door. Now recently, I conducted a study through my research unit on how students are engaging with their devices, specifically when they're doing online courses. We wanted to know, are you using your mobile devices? What other kinds of devices are you using when you're accessing the learning management system, when you are engaging with videos, and when you're doing games and simulations? Because we have a multimedia team with our eCampus group 
that is designing for everything. And they got curious one day and said, are they even using their phones for this? What's going on here? So first we wanted to know what devices do you have, what do you like to use, how are you using them? And we found out that of a little over 2,000 students that answered our survey, this is just Oregon State students, so if you want, you can say, well, our students are different. That's fine. But in our student population, 99.98% of them have a laptop. About the same number had a smartphone. We were curious about how they were using those smartphones. And everyone we talked to, we said, what do you think? Like, what, what's your hypothesis? And I asked my partner this, too. I was like, what do you think about this? And he said, well, I'm assuming they're using their phones for everything. Like, they're going to their online courses, they're doing their assignments, like, you know, there's probably an app, they're doing all that. 20% of them were using their phones. And only because they were portable. They didn't feel it was more convenient. They actually really, really didn't like the app. They felt like it was not effective. And they preferred larger screen sizes for things like videos and games and simulations, which makes sense that they would be doing that. What they are using their mobile devices for, and we didn't ask this in the study, but you can see it through things like your research, is things like fun, communication. So when we're competing against some of these things, they may not be using the devices for this. The devices weren't designed for education. And when you look at things like new virtual reality capability and augmented reality capability that's coming out of companies like Apple, they're not designing it for learning. They're designing it for things like games and entertainment and movies. So part of our job is to help our students shift into thinking about technology as a tool for learning and showing them how to do that, and not assuming that they already know. Because in most, okay, just checking that's on me. <laughs> I have my timer on over here, and I was like, what, I've had a time already? Um, we assume that they have this capacity in the same way that we assume they know how to do things like study. Didn't they pick it up along the way somewhere? Didn't their high schools show them how to use a tablet for learning? Well, in some cases, yeah, but not always. So one of the things that we can do is really start to understand how the brain is engaged with technology and how we can start to harness that for students' learning. Marilla Spinicky has an excellent book on motivation. It's a little bit theory heavy, but it's really good. And she says that if you understand how students learn, you can maximize the mileage you get out of any encounter. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the brain and technology so that we have a better understanding of what's happening here. And that will help us, I think, to kind of figure out some things that we can do in the classroom to help our students. So one of the key things when we think about the brain, this is one of my favorite comics. I forgot to make a backup copy of my brain, so everything I learned last semester was lost. We think about the brain in some ways as a kind of computer. Like, we've started to, like, make that connection for ourselves. Whether we're kind of consciously doing it or not, we talk about the brain in that way sometimes. We think about it as being kind of functional in that way. Sometimes people talk about using computers to outsource their brain, you know, like they put things onto the computer. A lot of um, artificial intelligence starting to think about um, technology in this way. But oftentimes the challenge with technology is we think about it as um, it's, it's something that happens kind of very quickly. We don't often have to remember things very well. Technology is kind of preparing us to not have to do that because we can always look things up. So one of the things we have to think about is how does the brain kind of interact, especially with things like the internet and with all of this information that's coming in really quickly. So a while back, there was actually an, several eye tracking studies that have been done. And we've been trying to understand how does the brain take in information, especially when people are kind of looking at that information. And what you'll see from this is what we found is that the brain scans, like the eyes scan the horizon. This goes all the way back to when we did not want to get eaten by a lion, and so we were looking around to make sure, like, what's going on? I need to know the whole picture of what's going on in my surroundings. And we never got rid of that. We still scan. We scan all the time. And what's kind of interesting is we've learned, um, and the internet definitely knows this, that typically we scan, especially on a page, in a capital F shape. We go across the top, 
and then we go down the side, and then we'll come up kind of to the middle, and we'll scan across like that. If you go on to CNN.com, CNN knows that that's what our brain is doing. It has set up its site to scan you across and to go down the side and then come up, and there's a nice little video in the middle there. So one of the things to know about our brain is that it just functions this way. It's not wrong. It's just kind of part of our evolution that the brain wants to scan. And what that means is that the brain does not naturally reflect. It will not do that unless we ask it to. Now, many of us in this room have gotten where we are today because we have learned to ask ourselves to do that work. And that's when we've synthesized information. Things have started to move back into long-term storage in our brain because we have done that kind of synthesis and reflection. But I can promise you that if you're not asking your students to do it, they're probably not doing it. Because their brains don't function that way. Many of our brains don't. So the key thing that we need to think about as we're getting our students into our classrooms, as we're preparing them to learn more information, is what can we do that will help them to pause and to ask things like critical questions, ask them to connect information in ways that maybe they hadn't thought of before, ask them to just reflect on what they're learning. And there's been a huge push in things like metacognition for this very reason. How do we help students understand how they learn, how the brain works? And there's an excellent book um, that recently came out by Sandra McGuire talking about this. And it's actually aimed at students, and it's called Teach Yourself How to Learn. And her definition of metacognition is one of my favorites. She says, it's like a big brain standing outside your brain, looking at your brain to see what it's doing. And I was like, students can get that. They can understand that we need to kind of open up our brains, look inside, and try to figure out what's going on there. But one of my favorite things, too, about metacognition is it really emphasizes the fact that every person is individual when it comes to how their learning works. Despite the fact that we know that the brain functions in certain ways, and it kind of does that across the, the gamut, motivation really impacts students. And there are a lot of kind of non-cognitive areas that impact them as well. So some of you may be familiar with the GRIT literature. Uh, this is coming out of um, Angela Duckworth. She has a very popular TED Talk on GRIT. And also Carol Dweck's work on mindset, which I heard talked about in several places in the room this morning. And the general idea is that you can put in more effort and it will increase your learning. That it's not kind of an inborn level of intelligence you have that is either going to kind of make or break you in terms of being a mathematician or in terms of having a certain skill set. This diagram is from a study that was looking at spelling bee finalists. And what it found was that what made the difference with them was a bunch of stuff that's non-cognitive. That is, it wasn't their GPAs. It wasn't their SAT scores. It wasn't their IQ levels. It was things like grit. It was things like their confidence levels, their levels of resilience bouncing back when something didn't work out in the way that they wanted to. That was the actual thing that was predicting longer term success for them. And what this means for us is it's the long game of looking at things like retention and graduation rates. That it may not be about that kind of information gathering and the testing and the, you know, do they have the pieces of content that we want them to have when they graduate? It's are they resilient enough to actually make it through our programs? So here's where all this kind of leads. Unfortunately, learning takes time. And it's kind of complicated. And it's also personalized. And we all know this. If you've been in a classroom for any length of time, you know this. Clive Thompson from his book says, efficiency is, isn't always the goal with cognition. If you want to deeply absorb knowledge, you often have to work inefficiently. Lingering and puzzling and letting ideas sink in. We need to do this, but our current digital environment is mostly designed to favor multitasking. This is the same argument that's made to some degree in Bored and Brilliant, which is we have to just sit and do nothing to let our brains figure things out. We also need to do things like sleep 
because it helps us to kind of make these connections, process things, and move them into long-term memory. In more and more of our classrooms, I think we're designing our curriculum to allow our students to go down a rabbit hole where they can really try to figure something out for themselves. And this is especially true in things like undergraduate research projects where we're helping our students to just fully explore something that they really want to know and that they have passion about. We want our students to engage with our curriculum in the same way that they get sucked into YouTube and they come out two hours later and they don't know how it happened. And I know that's never happened to anyone here. Certainly not to me. How can we encourage an environment where they're so motivated by what they're learning that they want to go and do that deep dive? I'd like you to pause here, turn to a neighbor, and talk about the last time that you did a super deep dive on something in your own learning. You might have to think back a little ways. What was that thing where you just kind of fell into it and you were like ravenous to figure out what it was, how you could learn more? And it doesn't have to be formal. It could be like, I took a cooking class on Thai cooking and it changed my world. Turn to a neighbor. When was the last time you took a deep dive? All right, let's come back. Come on back. Come on back. This room just got super animated. There were hand gestures. There was laughter. There was excited looks on your faces. I'd like to start by hearing, what are some of these topics that you're doing these deep dives with? Anybody have Thai food as a topic? <laughs> yes. I just recently learned. Uh, in oh, we got a mic runner. Yay. In, in Japan, there's a, a kind of a, a car decorating subculture. Um, they call the cars it Itasha, which means, um, oh, shit, what's it mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like a shameful car <laughs> because they, whatever. But anyway, so I decided, and usually it's, they decorate with images from anime and manga characters. And so I sort of did a version of this where I, I had to learn a bunch about kind of doing graphic design. And I worked with a, an online sticker making company and designed stickers that would fit precisely in my windows and <laughs> did some manipulation with the images to turn, for example, um, black on white line art imagery into white on black so that I could apply them to the windows of my car and they would be visible. And I basically spent the last um, two or three weekends like really spending a lot of time doing scanning and photoshopping, <laughs> all of which I had never really done that much. I am so. fascinated. <laughs> I <laughs> what was my car is at home. I live two miles off the house. Okay, well, I, I have pictures on my phone if you want. Okay, maybe stand up so people can see who you are in case you want to see the pictures later. Okay, that is fascinating. Okay, let's hear a couple more. We've got a couple folks with mics. Oh, one back here. The, na the natural history of lizards in Turkmenistan. Oh. You go. <laughs> That's great. What else do we have? And they don't all have to be, these are a little bit off the wall. They don't all have to be off the wall. We have a few comments from online, oh, from please. our online crowd. Yeah. Um, a number of people talking about uh, different, like WordPress or Drupal or um, different things they're doing online. And then somebody talking about uh, mindfulness. Uh, somebody who apparently was doing a session at a conference uh, last year and they cool. did a presentation on that. So they did a deep dive into mindfulness. Okay, love it. Up here? Uh, I do National Poetry Writing Month, and so this this is my non-work stuff. This month I wrote a sonnet every day, and so I did a deep dive into sonnet forms, and it turns out there's over 180 named sonnet forms, which include various rhyme schemes, patterns, rhymes in the middle of the line instead of at the beginning or the oh end, all kinds of stuff. I'm an English major, and I knew nothing about that. <laughs> Okay, so these topics, maybe we can get a couple more if anybody wants to share. Um, 
notice how you know you're listening to this and you're like, you maybe you don't want to do a deep dive on that. You know, you're thinking like, well, oh, that's not really for me. But are you like completely sucked in by their energy around it? <laughs> right? You want to know more because you're like, why? Like, why did you want to tell me more? Like, I want to learn more about it. I could talk to any of these people over lunch and be like, tell me more. Do we have at least one more over here? Yes. This one's very deep. Comparisons between LeBron James and Michael Jordan. <laughs> so maybe not you over lunch. No, I'm, just kidding. Just kidding. I'm not a sports person, but I can see, I mean, when we get into this, we can model this for our students. We can show them our enthusiasm. We can show them what is it that makes us want to do crazy things like dissertations on the topics that we did them on, which are always highly niche and things that no one really cares about. Except us. But in the midst of doing these deep dives, the thing we need to be careful about is not when we, we hand that control over to our students and we're asking them to kind of do this work, we cannot do it from a state of fear. This young gentleman is a student in Canada who started a Facebook study group in chemistry so that he could bring everyone together and they could figure out this chemistry business together. He was brought up on like 140 complaints of academic misconduct, one for every single student that was in that Facebook group. Really because this was early days of Facebook, well not early days, like mid 2000s was when this happened. And the school did not know what to do with it. He had gotten kind of innovative and thought, let's just all come together and kind of crowdsource this and figure it out together. And now we're like, well, people do this all the time. I mean, we want our students to do this. We're like encouraging them to do this. But at the time, they did not know what to do with that. And the faculty, thankfully, said, that's ridiculous. And said, no, we're not going to uphold this. But it's a really good example of when students start to use technologies in ways that were like, what are you doing exactly there? I have not seen that before. It's making me a little bit nervous. And also when we're handing over that control of their learning to say, we deeply want you to engage, it means we're not controlling what they're engaging with anymore. Or even how they're doing it. That's a fundamental shift. Because we're asking them to teach themselves. We're coming in as true guides on the side to try to help them navigate this world of technology and distraction. And we have to figure out how to do it knowing that they might know more about certain tools than we do. We might not fully understand functionalities. And we're in some ways talking a slightly different language about it. Now a good example of this is if you look at the literature around um, academic misconduct in online courses. And this was something that I did my own deep dive into when I was working on my book on blended course design because the biggest question I always get is if I move exams online, are they all going to be cheating? Are they all going to be like sitting in a library together taking the exam together? Like how do I stop that from happening? So I looked at the literature and what I found was studies have shown that there's actually like an equal amount basically of online academic misconduct than there is to kind of face-to-face -face academic misconduct. You'll always have the people who want to kind of get around and, and work around the system. But the bigger issue actually was that students' definitions of online academic misconduct differed significantly from faculty members' definitions because faculty didn't talk about it. They just assumed that students knew that it was an open book, that they shouldn't be talking about it with their peers, you know, they shouldn't be going on the internet and looking up answers. And the students were like, they just had no boundaries. They didn't know what it was supposed to be. Like they just had no sense of what they were supposed to do and not do. And so academic misconduct occurred because there was no explicit discussion about it. And once there was, it was like, oh, I understand the rules now. I can follow the rules. So in some ways, this is about helping our students to see some general boundaries around their learning. We're not just saying open call, do whatever you want for the next 45 minutes that we're together in the classroom. But it is about trying to give them more autonomy and choice because that's what the world will call for when they're not with us. And they won't always be given kind of the same rules. Now the other thing that this helps with when they have more autonomy and choice 
is that they're doing more of the work. And this is a key element of active learning and student-centered learning that Terry Doyle talks about in his couple of books. And one of the things he said that um, I really love is it's the one who does the work who does the learning. And this is actually one of the key arguments against active learning is that, well, what's your job then? If they're the ones who are doing all the, th the stuff, what are you getting paid to do to stand up in front of the room and what are you doing? Facilitating? Like there's a lot of skepticism around that. But think about your deep dive that you did, the one that you described just now. Did somebody else hand you that information? Like you had to go out and find it in probably a range of ways, some of which might have included YouTube tutorials. But you went out and, and figured that out on your own. You grappled with those ideas. You asked the questions. You went out and found the information that would help you to answer them. This is why a lot of things like problem-based learning work so well. Or undergraduate research, like I mentioned, work so well. Because students are kind of grappling with those questions and trying to figure out what to do. And they're the ones who've already done the work. However, they may be coming out of an educational culture that's not asking them to do that. They might be looking for workarounds like this. Um, use textbook, already highlighted by previous owner. Cool, no need to read the whole thing. When we ask them to engage in the work, they're not always like, great. They don't necessarily want to do it. But this is where I think that in some ways technology can really help us because they do want to engage with technology. They've been raised with it. They use it for entertainment like we talked about before. Technology can be like that zucchini and the brownies <laughs> where we're sneaking it in. And we do have to understand that our students are motivated by really really different things. And so when we can find that thing where they want to do the deep dive, where they really truly want to be engaged, it may not be about the content, it may be about a tool. Like if you ask your students to create a podcast around something, they may not really care about the content that they're creating it around, but they can really get behind the podcasting bit. That motivation can seep over into the content. And we can use that to our advantage. So as we're closing out today, I want to ask what does all of this mean for learning? And more specifically, what does it mean for your individual classroom? And I want to talk about some of the things that we can do in the midst of all of this to help students learn. And then I have a little homework assignment for you. And then we'll have some nice Q&A as well. So how do we help students learn given all of this information? Here are some really practical ideas. We can start by helping students reflect on their own learning through short assignments that focus on formative assessment. Things like minute papers, things like um, including a reflective piece when they turn in a larger assignment to say how did that go? What did they learn as they were working on that paper, project, poster, whatever it might be? How many of you are already doing something like this where you're asking students to reflect? Yeah, this is something that we're, many of us are already doing. We can also incorporate cognitive literature and evidence into our rationales for how we're using technology in our classrooms. This is a big one, especially if you're doing things like laptop bands. Tell them why. Don't just do the band. They need to understand that there's a rationale for that. And in your handouts, there's actually an example it's from a law class, hence its length. <laughs> and it was an appendix that someone put on their syllabus trying to explain why she had the technology policy she did in the classroom using literature that students could look to. To say, this is why I don't want you to multitask, or this is why I'm concerned about things like cognitive load. Talking with your students about this, and not just once, but many times throughout the term, can be a helpful way for them to understand the relationship between technology and learning. We can also design assignments that encourage grit and perseverance, helping them to work through when something is not working in the way that they want, get past that point. 
And if there are any academic writers in the room, we have all been there. Where you're like, I don't think this is going to come together. I don't think I have anything to say. And then you figure it out. And you put something out into the world that otherwise nobody would have ever seen before. This is what we're trying to help our students to do. And you can also praise your students' effort and hard work rather than their intelligence. And that's coming straight out of the grid literature, what we know about perseverance, resilience. A few more things, talking to your students about learning overtly and repeatedly. And this is an argument that I make that's very similar to the study skills. I've had a lot of people say to me, it's not my job to teach them how to study. And other people say, it's not my job to teach them about learning. Oh, yes, it is. That is what classrooms are for. Yes, they're learning content and skills and abilities, but they also have to figure out how to do that when they're not with us anymore. That is the most important thing we can do for them, is to help them to become lifelong learners that are untethered from us as instructors. You can also offer tips for using technology for learning and not just social communication. And this is one of those things where it's not super formal, you can just pepper it into a classroom talking about how you are using your own technology in certain ways, how you found a really cool podcast that you've been learning a ton about, how you found an app that's helping you to learn a new language, I mean, whatever it could be, but just talking about it. And you can also share your own strategies for focusing on learning, for example, not multitasking, not overloading yourself cognitively, although it's super hard. <laughs> but trying to emphasize passion, mindfulness, and things like spaced repetition. How are you learning new things? Because we all are. We don't stop. So how can we talk with our students about what we're doing and what's working for us, especially since we all know we're in the same age of digital distraction together? And lastly, we can incorporate the digital into our classrooms. And that's the part that is the most personalized, based on your discipline, based on your pedagogical style. Some people do this a lot. Some people do this very minimally. But as I talk with lots of people about teaching across all the modalities, and we define that as like traditional, hybrid, blended, web enhanced, fully online, traditional is starting to not exist anymore. Technology is always there somewhere, usually with at least a learning management system component. So how do we start to do that in a really intentional way that is trying to leverage our students' learning as best we can? So now for the homework. I'd like you to think about choosing an area of your focus for your students, and maybe one that you see them struggling with in particular. It could be metacognition, it could be multitasking, cognitive load, information literacy, I mean, any of these things if you find they're using their technology too much during class time, and find some literature to share with them about it. And it's not hard. Google, Google Scholar, Google Citations. I mean, like, you can just Google and see kind of what's out there. There are plenty of studies talking about these things. You can either have a conversation with them, or you can do like the example that I've shown you here and write maybe a small appendix or a paragraph in your syllabus that talks about that literature Maybe you're citing any kind of digital etiquette or netiquette that you want them to engage in in your course. Any device policies you have that are relevant, like you want phones to be away during certain elements of class time. And if you want, you can tie in a brief assignment for them to start to kind of think about this and what it means to be away from their phones or engaging in the ways that you're encouraging. Okay, so today, we explored our own digital lives a little bit and the realities of today's digital age. We learned more about how the brain is affected by the digital, and we looked at how technologies might be able to help us. And we also asked what all of this means for our students' learning and our own classroom practices. I want to thank you so much for your time and attention today and open it up for questions. Thank you. All right, so I know we've got some folks with microphones. If there are questions. I see one over here. Yes. I'm curious.
first where the thoughts are, uh, and with digital research, the, uh, one of the problems is for students is knowing when to stop. And I'm curious what strategies you, what strategies you think of in terms of get, uh, enabling students to know when to sort of stop with their deep dive. Ooh, that's a good question. So there's some really interesting literature, and I've been looking into this for a different project I'm working on, um, around a form of scholarship of teaching and learning called decoding the disciplines. Has anybody heard of this, decoding the disciplines? And the general idea is trying to find bottlenecks in student learning that are discipline specific. And one of the areas of concentration for this, um, perhaps not surprisingly, is the literature review in many disciplines. Students have no idea how to do it and they don't get explicit instruction on how to do a literature review. And it reminds me of your question, because I think it's kind of similar. How do you know that you've gone far enough that you can do the thing you want to do, that you can achieve the goal you want to achieve? And I think that part of it is knowing the goal from the start. When you start the deep dive, what is the purpose of it? Are you trying to, and it's almost like, in some ways, setting your own learning goals. Like, we have to help students understand what it would mean to tie a learning goal to an objective that could be measured? Like, how would they know that they've gone deep enough? Well, they would be able to do this thing. And they would have to articulate that. They would have to know, this is how I would measure that I've been effective in this area. I would be able to write a short essay on it or talk to someone who is not an expert in the field about it and explain it to someone else or, um, you know, whatever that measurement might be. So I feel like that's part of the answer. And in some ways, it's tied to this idea of the literature review in that there are kind of mental tasks that go along with a deep dive that students, when they're deep diving in YouTube, they're not necessarily thinking of the mental tasks. Shocking, I know. Um, but when we're asking them to deep dive for educational purposes, we want them to recognize that. So we would want them to recognize things like flow, where you kind of like get so involved that you like lose track of time. And we've had this happen, I'm sure, in many of our lives in, in all kinds of things, like marathon running, um, uh, when you're reading something you're really engaged with, like you just kind of lose all track of time. Those are the kinds of things we would want to be training them on so they can recognize them when they're happening. So that would be my answer to that question. Yes? As students are interacting with these tools, they're leaving behind a, a digital footprint. Oh yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, have you even much thought about how we can surface that footprint to them, uh, and maybe even help nudge the path of that digital footprint to more productive ways? Yes, this is a really good question. And I think especially around conversations on privacy. And this is a question that often comes up when I talk with people about just using digital tools more generally in the classroom is what about privacy, especially with social media. And it's very timely to be talking about that right now. I think that we're at an interesting place where people are starting to realize just how much data is out there on the internet about them. Everyone, not just our students. Um, and there are a lot of things that once it's on the internet, it doesn't really go away. And it can be hidden, but it's kind of easily found. These conversations about privacy and intentionality around artifacts that you're creating and why, um, in some ways goes back to the conversation about goals. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to create? And how is it representative of a larger portfolio? For me, this conversation is really informing a lot of the work I'm doing right now around what a lot of people don't want to call but kind of is a personal brand. Um, it's what you're known for. It's what distinguishes you from other people. It's how people come to search for you on the internet, um, how they find you when they're searching for another term and your name comes up. Those are the kinds of conversations I think we're not quite having with our students and they kind of accidentally fall into creating things that maybe they don't want to or they just don't realize they're creating. Or we're getting to a stage now where their parents have created them for them before they knew or were cognizant and now there's a bunch of stuff on the internet that they didn't have control over. So that conversation is coming because we're just getting to the point where people have been sharing about their children online in a way that is going to come to perhaps by them later on. Yes. Uh, I have a 10 year old daughter, so I'm very, I'm, I'm acutely aware of how the K-12 system is preparing undergraduates. I only teach undergraduates. 
Um, can you speak a little bit about sort of the, the No Child Left Behind generation and teaching for the test and, and kind of what undergraduate instructors are inheriting? Right. Um, I can. <laughs> so what I would say about that is it's a little bit of a pickle in that K-12 instructors are some of the most creative people you will ever meet. They are incredible at what they do. In some ways, their hands have been tied. And for a number of reasons that many of us are probably well aware of from reading the news and understanding education policy in even the most general way. And I think that they're doing what they can in very constrained environments. But it doesn't mean that when our students come to us, we don't have to undo some things. Um, but that is true of anything that our students are coming to us with. They may come to us with other kinds of ideas that are misconceptions of our disciplines. I started out in women and gender studies. That's my discipline of origin. And students came into that with all kinds of things that were just not true. We had no facts to back it up. I've also worked with a lot of faculty in law schools. Students come into the criminal classes. All they know is law and order from the television. <laughs> it is full of misconceptions. You know, like it's not just coming from K-12. It's coming from everything. It's just what we talked about today. All the stuff that is coming at them is forming all kinds of misconceptions um, or things that maybe we would consider to be that way. So I think what's interesting though about K-12 is in many ways they are ahead of us in terms, uh, in ter ahead of higher ed in terms of things like rubrics in terms of things like organizing information. Like students will come into higher ed and say, where's my rubric? Like they're, they're trained in that way to understand that learning is measurable. That is a benefit. It may have been taken too far in teaching to the test, but understanding that you can measure learning and be assessed on it in a way that is helping you understand yourself better, to me that's a strength. So I feel like we can kind of look in there and figure out what, how do we not throw out the baby with the bathwater? Like, what are the things we can pull out of that and really use? And how can we partner with K-12 to have larger conversations about that? Because I think we all want to be making this as best we can for our students. Good question. Thank you for coming here today. It's been really good. Thank you um, for having me. My colleague and I teach at the School of Nursing, and so much of what we do is trying to get the student to listen. And we struggle with that aspect, to just listen. Um, in the classroom, I see if I have a guest speaker and it's time to listen to them and there's no attached PowerPoint, well, now it's time to be on Twitter and Facebook. Or with the patient to get the history and the assessment. Is it, is it so much FOMO, as you were saying, they're, they're, that they're feverishly trying to write everything? Or it's a time to tune out? Where does listening come into this? So you, you get so much from just right. listening. It's a really good question. And actually, like, I struggle with this. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's just hard. It's hard for me sometimes to have a conversation, especially if my mind is elsewhere. I'm definitely one of those, like, absent-minded professors sometimes. Um, but what I would actually, what's interesting about that question in particular is, and I brought this book up a couple of times, but, um, and I can't remember the author's name, but it's Bored and Brilliant. It's by the woman who does the podcast Note to Self, which is about kind of integrating technology into your daily life. And she wrote about this challenge that she did for her podcast audience about trying to kind of separate yourself from technology in particular ways, each day doing a different thing. So like not carrying your phone around when you're in transit, like those kinds of things. And one of the people she profiles talks about how Though there is no proof, let me be clear, there are no studies that back this up. He feels that technology has given him adult onset ADHD. There are no studies. Let me be very, very clear. <laughs> no studies. Especially for the medical folks in the room, you're like, mm. um, But one of the things that the author raises is there are things that technology is doing to our brains that we don't understand yet. Just because we don't have an experimentally designed study to back it up doesn't mean something isn't happening there. And I think when it comes to this question about listening, we're in an environment where you don't really have to do it all that much. In the same way of, and I, there was a different study I read that was talking about how we remember things differently when we read digitally versus when we read a book printed. And it's not that we don't remember the same things, but we remember them out of order. 
if you read it in a Kindle, you don't remember it happening chronologically in the same order than if you read it in a printed book. So when we're not practicing listening in other ways, and then you're asked to do it, it's going to be hard. It's not that they don't want to necessarily, but it's going to be difficult. So I would take a skill like that and, and try to make it as micro as possible. I think asking people to listen to a 45 minute lecture, no PowerPoint slides, nothing to kind of engage them visually is like the master exam. Take it all the way back down to, in some ways, listening comprehension um, of like small clips, like micro moments. What are you picking up? And listening, active listening is so much more than just hearing. It's watching, it's engaging, it's emotional intelligence. I mean, like there's so many things going on there. And I think that one of the things we can do with learning and um, decoding the disciplines really pulls this out is there are layers of cognition that are happening in any learning moment. And we just call it a thing like listening, but it's actually all this other stuff stacked up together to do it effectively. So we actually have to remove each of those things and train students how to do it and then put them back together and say, this is what listening is. And it takes time to do that and it's not easy. But I actually think that that's one of the more effective ways we can help students learn is by breaking it out. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently for another talk that I'm developing around time management. We call it time management, but it's actually like seven other things that are all stacked up. And we're just like, oh, you're just not good at time management. Well, there's like all these things in time management that you have to do. So, I mean, it happens all over. It's not just with listening. I mean, it's really anything that's kind of meaty is going to have that. Any final questions? Any from our streamers? OK. Um, I teach a project, um, project-based course, um, and the one complaint that students have is that it's not enough time in one semester, right. and they would rather do a year or more of the same course. Good for you. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple things. One is you can say in kind of a real-world environment, which is often why we train them to do these kinds of project-based assignments, you will not often have enough time. Like you'll have a deadline and you'll have to figure out what to do. Um, and it may not be what you want it to be and you have to kind of get it done anyway. But in some ways I think it's kind of going back to the question about listening. So there's this really good quote. I've kind of been obsessed with it recently. It's by Seth Godin, who's like an internet entrepreneur marketer. I don't know if anybody knows who that is. He has this quote that says, you don't need more time, you just need to decide. I'm obsessed with that quote. It's really good. It's so simple and it's so, but it's, so it kind of goes back to that stacking. Like it may not be that you need more time. It might be that you need to be more decisive. You need to be able to synthesize information more quickly. You might be able, you might need to take a risk not knowing what the outcome is going to be because you have to move on. All of those things could be incredible skills for our students to learn that aren't just about managing your time. So I, I think it could be a larger conversation to say, what is it about it that they don't like? Is it that they feel rushed? Is it that they feel that they're not learning? That would be, I would center it around the learning. And if, it may be that they're learning just fine, it's just uncomfortable to do it on that time frame. in which case maybe we should be preparing them for that. Sorry, time for just one more question. One more. Hi, so my question revolves around this idea of pushing a, more and more into um, the time students are spending thinking and working on their own and expected to guide themselves. Um, depending on where the students come from, they have more or less skills and there's some right. huge equity issues there. Right. Um, but then we do, like now when we go to a new job, they're expecting you to know everything before you get there, on the job training is like almost disappearing. Sure. So they need those skills. Um, so how do you strike the balance between um, 
helping the students that don't have necessarily that experience, even if they have other experiences, and the students who need more of that. So I hope you're coming to the afternoon workshop because there will be stuff on that in the afternoon workshop. So that'll be the simple answer. Um, come to the afternoon okay. workshop. Um, but I also think, because there's, there's a difference between um, what I talk in, in the workshop about is kind of guided inquiry and helping students to do things more independently. And you can set up assignments so that both happen and that you can kind of balance out what students need in various ways. But I also think the maybe longer answer I would give to that is I think it's really rooted in metacognition. The more students can understand their own limitations, whatever they might think those are, the better they will be able to ask us for assistance. And then we're not relying on ourselves. Think about how many students you teach in any given classroom. It could be 15, it could be up to 200. Us trying to channel out what each of those individual students need, we're going to miss something. But if they can tell us, I'm struggling, I have this, you know, like I'm not doing this in the same way as someone else, and I can see that like I can see that this isn't working for me in the way that it needs to, then we're not having to teach them all, all those things, we're just having to teach them metacognition, which I think is a simpler thing to try to get our students kind of all on the same page about. Now it's not, I mean that's not gonna fix it for everything and I think there are larger kind of structural issues at play there that need to be addressed as well, but we need to give our students the tools to understand how they learn and how to communicate that to us so that we can help them like it's getting too unmanageable for us to try to look out into the sea of faces and try to figure it out for each individual student. So I do think metacognition is in there. It's a solution to some of that. But we're gonna be tackling that a little bit in this afternoon. So hopefully we'll do a deeper dive there. Thank you, everyone. This was really great. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. That was awesome. I really appreciate that. Lots to think about. Um, all right, so Enriching Scholarship is fully open now, so go forth. Enjoy your sessions. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you back in the conference survey, and I just hope you enjoy week. It's wonderful weather, so get out there and enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>